Ladies and gentle folk, welcome back to Food for Thought Live. Thank you very much for joining us for episode 21. And um, I hope you've had a wonderful week. I hope you're having a lovely weekend. This is, a, this is our first broadcast on a Sunday, I think. So uh, we're checking out a new time, a new day, see how, how that lands with you fine people. Um, and, uh, and the same will be true next weekend. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a heads up. Uh, about my guest the next weekend at the end of this this discussion this evening. Um, so I'm going to go straight to my guest this evening. And the reason why is because we've gone global tonight. We've gone uh, all the way across to Africa. And I don't want to take too many chances with the internet connection. So, uh, But I will just tell you a funny story that when we went to test this last week, my internet was down here in London. So... Anyway, um, I want to say a huge thank you to Virginia McKenna, who put me in touch with our guest this evening, um, because she admires this this uh, this woman deeply, and and her work, and I do too, having become aware of her and familiar with her work. And I'm very very honoured, and and proud and happy and excited to introduce you to Karen Paulilo from the Turgway Hippo Trust, all the way from Zimbabwe. <laughs> it's surreal. It's surreal, Dan. I'm here in the bush and you're in London. It's unbelievable. But it's, it's great to meet wonderful. you. And Dan, thank you so thank you so much for the invite because you've had so many illustrious guests, and I'm so honored to be on it. Thank you. Well, tonight we have another illustrious guest, and we're we're honored to have you. We're honored to have you. And 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 you know, when I've when I've looked into your story and, and learned what I have in the time since Virginia made me aware of you. I'm so in awe of what you do and I'm very excited for you to share some of your story with, with the folks watching tonight. And with that in mind, because it's not just what you do, but it's how you got there. So, because as people will have gathered already, um, you're, you're not, you don't have a Zimbabwe accent, you have an English accent. <laughs> That's how, right, how, um, I am. Tell us how it all started it's for you. Basically, that's quite correct, Dan. Um, Virginia's got a big part in it, actually, because it's a bit of a long story. I'll try and condense it very quickly. Um, I was born in England, in London, uh, North London. Um, my parents had maybe something to do with my love for animals. My dad was a vet. My mum worked in unbelievable, a little zoo, but it was a petting zoo at Woburn Abbey at the Duke of Bedford's place right. so as a tiny little girl I was surrounded by animals um, which was great because for a child there's nothing better and I think it's actually the best upbringing any child can have you, right. you must be with animals I as agree. a little girl or a little boy then yeah. you, learn, you learn a lot yeah right. mm. um, and then basically um, when I was very little mum read me a book and the book was born free which is the story of Elsa the lioness, which I'm sure loads of people know about. Right. And later still, I got to see the movie with Virginia McKenna. So she became, and her husband, Bill Travers, actual heroes for me because they were part of the whole thing, the born free business. And from literally that very young age, I got this obsession, a focus as a child, which used to drive my mom mad, that I was going to Africa. And mom would say, yeah, sure, sure. And I'd say, no, mom, I'm going to Africa. And it started as a seven-year-old. Right. Um, then to cut a very long story condensed, I, at the age of, well, mom was running the zoo. So I was gr growing up with animals. And I got to run around Woburn Abbey on a pony who I was my first love called Kuchek mm -hmm. and um, get to see the deer. There are like 10 species of deer at the abbey. And right. because I was a precocious little um, I was allowed to sit with the tourists on, on a, a safari vehicle at Woburn Abbey and tell the, the people on the vehicle about the deer, which at the age of seven was really special and eight. Um, right. And so I got that connection with animals. Um, and then um, at the age of 14, much to my absolute disgust now, but I was a child, I joined a circus. Right. And the reason wow. behind that was there, there used to be a traveling circus that came to where I lived in Buckinghamshire. And every time it came, I would zoom there and ask to help with the animals. And they usually let you groom the horses or do something with the horses. And I'm horse mad. So that was perfect. But then they saw how 
keen I was, and they offered me a job in my school holidays. So without telling my mum, I made a deal with them, and I said, contact me, and I gave them my address, and that was that. And sure enough, Telegram came, right. and when I got home from school, there's my mother looking perturbed, and she's got a Telegram saying, join the circus um, in Tilbury or Gray's End. And I had a great mum, and she took me to the circus. And for the next three and a half weeks in my school holidays at Easter, I worked on a circus. And then I learnt, and my goodness did I learn. Because when you're a child, you see things in a different way to as you grow older, as you know. Cool. And I thought it was all glamour and animals being happy and all that, and I realised it wasn't. Right. I realised the animals that had the most hassle were the lions, the tigers, the bears, all the wild animals that, although they were born in captivity, they were being made to perform for people. Right. And it was disgusting and I didn't like it, but I was stuck because I was in the circus and I was there. So I hung in there until mum came to pick me up after three and a half weeks, but I learned an awful lot. What it did do is make me even more convinced that I had to get to Africa and I had to be with wild animals, animals that were free, and I wanted to do something for animals, but I wasn't quite sure how. Um, I trained as a journalist, didn't stay with it for various reasons. Then through my cousin, great girl Becky, she got me a job in the weirdest of places, a casino. And I became a croupier. I didn't even know what a casino was. I had never no. been in one. And it was a con. She got me for an interview. But anyway, I became a croup. But the biggest thing about becoming a croupier was that one of the guys in the casino had worked in Zimbabwe. Right. And he knew all about Zimbabwe. So every break from our work, that's all we talked about. And it was Africa this, Africa that. And the more he told me, the more I said, I've got to get there. I've got to be in Africa. I've got to work with animals. So he contacted his old boss in the Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. And they offered me a job 10 days later. So I quit my job. I rang my mom and I said, I'm going to Africa and off I went and arrived at the Victoria Falls. Then the fun began because once you're in Africa, you learn so much as you know, because you've been there. But I was a girl. I had no experience with wildlife yeah. and I wanted to work in the bush. I didn't want to be a croupier. Um, and I tried very hard and nothing was coming and it, I wasn't getting anywhere. And also no girls worked in the bush as such in that era. It was men. It was a man's job. It wasn't right. for women. Of course. Um, am I waffling too much for you, Dan? Not. <laughs> I hope at, not. Not at all. Cool. This is fascinating. Please keep going. This is perfect. Okay. So basically, um, I tried everything to get a job in the bush. I wasn't succeeding. I did get offered a few jobs in safari camps in catering. Right. Um, or as an assistant to management, but not in the bush. And I wanted to be in the bush. Luckily, through actually a boyfriend who knew another guy, who knew another guy, he found this guy wanting to start photographic safaris. Now, the next bombshell, he was a hunter, a professional hunter. I knew nothing about hunting at that stage. Right. But he wanted to stop hunting. And he actually interviewed me and said, listen, I've been hunting for a couple of years. I am sick of it. I'm sick of the whole ego, death everything that goes with it, and I want to turn to photographic safaris and quit this killing and stop it altogether. He used to have clients. He wasn't doing the hunting. He had clients from mainly the States. And he said, I also want to be forward thinking and, and basically wake up the world and have a girl and have a girl doing photographic safaris. Right. At that time, it was all boys. And he said, are you, are you up for it? And, of course, I said, no. And I said, yes, please. And basically he employed me. And then we got the whole saga of where he was, which was down here in the southeast low felt, the whole world that we met, the people in his environment, thinking he'd got himself a wife, a girlfriend, the whole scene, because I was living with him in his house in the bush. Right. So the times were wagging. And he was a gentleman. He was a gorgeous guy. He wasn't looking for a girlfriend. He was just very forward thinking. And he wanted a photographic guide who was a girl. Next problem, he starts to teach me the bush and his trackers uh, taught me the bush. But now I've got to sit a license to become a professional guide. No girl's ever done it. So National Parks didn't know what to do with me because it was a man's job and it was mainly hunting questions in those days. It was to do with 
the size of measuring a dead animal and all sorts of stuff like that. Mm. Um, and you had to obviously have experience with guns. Um, and it wasn't as detailed as it is now. And fortunately, then you didn't have to kill anything. Now a guide actually has to qualify by killing an animal to protect the client. Yeah. But at that stage, it was new and we didn't have to do that. So I didn't have to do that. If I had had to, I wouldn't have become a guide. I can't kill. I'm a vegetarian going vegan. Um, so basically, um, I sat the license with all these big guys that were all professional hunters giving me right. filthy looks and thinking I was nuts. What was I doing there? And I passed. And in fact, I beat a couple of hunters who failed and they had to resit. So for a British girl, that was, yay. <laughs> and then my boss, Graham, had his professional guide. And then we started working. And I worked in the low felt. I worked in Gonrejou a bit. And I worked on, in the area in the low felt on a private ranch area that had a lot of game, a lot of wildlife. Right. Um, but as I did the guiding, I realized that although it was a fantastic job and you met some lovely people as tourists. Mm. I was dealing more with the public than with the animals. Um, because when you work as a guide, if you're any good, the, the, the main thing is your client and to make sure that they're happy, that they're enjoying it, they're not bored, they're not cold, that everything's right, the food's right, everything's right. So you concentrate 100% on your client, their safety, everything, and you don't really get to enjoy the animals for yourself because it's them you're thinking about. And I wanted to not only work with animals, I wanted to put something back into animals. And being a safari guide, I was just getting paid to do a job, but I wasn't helping animals. So I wasn't getting anywhere. Now, right. this is where Virginia or Book Free comes in. I had been writing to George Adamson, the original Mr. Born Free and his wife, Joy. Joy was dead by then, but George was in contact with me and I've been writing to him for a couple of years. And I decided to take the gamble and go and meet him in Cora. And he, there he is, that's George. Is. Um, that was when I was with him in Cora. And basically I went up there with my mum because I was a little bit nervous to, to meet George up there in the middle of the bush in Cora. And we hired a car in Nairobi and drove there. It's a hell of a drive. It was about eight hours, if I remember right, a lot of dust and whatever. So my mum was being very good. When we got there, there was George, his staff, and a couple of uh, volunteer guys. And um, George was everything I had hoped he would be. He was a man that loved animals. He was a man that had done hunting. He had had to kill animals. He'd even killed Linus, Elsa's mum. Um, for various reasons, he had to do this, but he'd changed. He didn't want to kill anymore. He wanted to help. And his whole thing, as we all know, that follow Born Free was to protect lions from captivity, put them back where they belong. And everybody said he couldn't do it. And George was a maverick and he said, wait, no ways, I'll do it. And he did it. And in the time that George worked with lions, if you don't know, he, I think, released 33 Yes, some died, some even had to shoot himself for various reasons, but a lot of them bred, had cubs, and went back to where they belong, which is in Africa, in the wild, and not in a zoo, not in a circus, not as a pet, and they survived. But through meeting George, my mum took me outside when we first met him, and she said, are you disappointed? Because George had a kikoi on, a bare chest, a long beard, and he was 80-something years of age. And I said, no ways, he's everything I wanted. And he was a gentleman. He held a chair for you. He, he was a gentleman. So my mom didn't really understand because it wasn't her thing. It was my thing. Then to help mom, when we left George, George had said he would employ me. And it was dodgy because like everywhere in Africa, you, you have to come in and go out and you just don't get a job just like that. It's not easy. And I wanted to take in, I was going to take the job as his assistant and work with him because his previous assistant had left with Tony Fitzjohn to go to Tanzania. So it was a perfect timing for me to go there. Unfortunately, or well, fortunately, two reasons. I took mum down to the coast because she was tired from the bush and everything. And I met my husband, Jean Roger, who happened to be on holiday in Malindi. So boom, now we've got a love story and we've got George, my hero, and a choice to live with him and work with him. And it was hard, very hard to make that decision, and I mean it. But Jean won. 
Jean Roger. Um, and I wrote to Jean, uh, George, and George wrote back and said, good for you. That is what you're supposed to do. If love knocks on the door, go for it, you know. And he was quite fine about it. Beautiful. Then I joined Jean, and we went to Europe. And we went back to Holland, which nearly killed me because I had been living in Africa, and I love right. Europe, but I can't live there anymore. I'm Africanized. And it was very hard, and I got all the things that people that live with space and wide open areas and bush get when they go back to civilization. It's scary. Um, at the same token, um, I wanted to get back to Africa. And luckily for me, my husband is a great guy. He understood I was going literally nuts. I would sit there in the apartment and play lions roaring and hippos oh. calling, and our neighbors like thought we were completely insane. <laughs> because I put it full volume. That's how much I missed Africa. I can relate. Um, <laughs> oh, I know you can. You've been there. You know it. You feel it. I think you have to come here next, Dan. If you don't come here, I'll be very upset. Well, I just I was just sharing James's comment on screen right now, um, where I'm sure he's missing it just as much. He's supposed to he's saying he's supposed to be with you in September volunteering, um, but very much looking forward to yeah. when he can get out there. I'm sure, and so am I. Absolutely. Great. Well, I hope so. And if you don't come, I'll, I'll write dirty letters to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I may just hold off a little bit, just see what those dirty letters look like. But then I'm coming, definitely. But please okay, carry on. on. The story is absolutely gripping. And there's so many people writing lovely comments about this story. And it's just so, so lovely to hear. So please continue. Well, thank you. And, and I hope it makes other people know that if you really want something, and I was like six when this started, you can get it. It took a while. You don't get it like that. And it a lot of hardship, but you can get anything you want in life if you really want it. It's called focus and determination. But anybody can get anything they want, anything. Absolutely. Anyway, back to the story. So, like, now I'm going nuts in Holland. Um, and to the extent where my husband went to his employer, his boss, and said, listen, um, my next posting, he was a, he's a geologist. Um, could we make it Africa to keep my wife as my wife? <laughs> <laughs> and the boss was a really cool guy and he said sure so he had we had two options uh nigeria or gabon gabon in western africa was in the jungle nigeria wasn't so of course sean said well my wife will need gabon if possible and we got it so the next yeah. minute we find ourselves flying to um, Gabon. we've got my two pussy cats from zimbabwe we've got two new pussy cats from holland and we arrive in Gabon. We then were in a compound, which I've never lived in in my life, and it was all very new and very different. But the great thing was the bush was amazing. Got to meet the only national park guy in a place called Setakama, where we were in the Gamba, in, in um, uh, Gamba. And we were allowed, because I was an ex-safari guide, to go there whilst the company, which was uh, Shell, were not allowed to go there. Um, because he'd had hassles for various reasons with various people. Um, but because I was next guide, we were allowed to go there and see the National Park and see hippos in the sea and buffalo in the sea and pygmy elephants and yeah. gorillas. No, I missed the gorillas and chimpanzees. So we had an amazing time. Right. But it was a completely different kind of Africa to the bush of Southern Africa. You you walk in the bush in Gabon, you don't need shoes. It's so soft, the, the foliage. You know, you, you've got dense forest, jungle. So it was great. But Amazing. again, I was just actually being a wife, but at the same token, because I'm who I am, I was a stroppy one, in the people in Gabon, in the compound, were buying animals. They were buying monkeys. They were buying uh, parrots. They were buying handbags made from snakes. They were buying ivory, and I could not handle this. Now, company wives are supposed to keep their mouths closed and be company wives. I can't play that game. So I started to write in the local newspaper for the company, explaining to people that that little monkey, for them to buy it and put it in a cage, not only was it captivity and it would kill it anyway, but it had a mum, and they killed the mum to sell the monkey. The snake had a life until it ended up as a handbag. The ivory, which I actually was our neighbors, who was a French lady, and I had an amazing fight with her in French, and I never knew I could swear so fluently in French because, man, <laughs> well did I let go. 
good for you. She had bloody ivory. The ivory had blood on it. Oh. The poacher was at her doorstep with the ivory with blood on it. Oh. So I just lost oh. it and lost it beautifully. Um, Ooh, and so much you. so I scared the poacher and he left because I'm quite rabid when I get angry. And um, so yeah. he left. She didn't buy our ivory. And the incredible thing was the company didn't allow people to buy things like that. Shell didn't allow it. But she was from a contractor's. Um, they were contractors. And they'd learned that they could put ivory in table lakes and smuggle it back to France and places like that. And they didn't do it to kill the elephant. They just wanted the ivory. They, they just liked ivory. But they didn't realize what they were doing to their animals. Right. Um, what? happened from my newsletters was actually incredible because um, people came to me in the compound and said, we didn't realize, we didn't know that the parrot had been trapped. We, we, we thought they were tame parrots. Right. Uh, we didn't know the baby monkey had lost its mama. And these are adults. They're not children that, that didn't know. And you can't blame them. Of course. Because they didn't know. You they know, if you haven't know, lived yeah. in yeah, you, you don't know. You live in England, you go to the pet shop and you buy a parrot, you know, if you're that way inclined. Mm -hmm. um, so they didn't know. So it did some good. It actually woke some people up, but it possibly didn't do the company image too good because the wife was kind of saying things. Troublemaker. And the reason I'm telling this story, sorry? A troublemaker, it, which we're very really glad that you were. Yeah, a troublemaker. Yeah, exactly, a troublemaker, which kind of fits the bill. <laughs> what it is, is I can't stand injustice. I, I can't stand to see cruelty. I can't stand to see ignorance through uh, aggression. Ignorance through ignorance, I understand it and try and help. But through aggression or through uh, being a nasty person, it gets me mad. And then I'm very mad. Sure. But anyway, long story. Um, the end result was that while all this was going on, there was a problem in Gabon. The um, Gabonese and the Senegalese didn't like each other and they started killing each other. Shell panicked. They decided to evacuate the cities where they had employees. And we were still okay in Gamba. And then things got a bit out of hand and Shell didn't want wives and children damaged. So they said, okay, all wives and children out. Um, we are evacuating you. Right. No animals. So people started to put their animals to sleep. Oh. Now, my best friend was a doctor there. He was putting dogs to sleep and other animals. And I said to my husband, I'm not putting my four cats to sleep. I am not leaving here without the cats. They don't let me take the cats. I don't leave. And my husband, who totally understood and was completely behind me, said, of course, they're, they're ours. You know, they're, people are taking their children. We'll take our cats. They're not our kids, but we're not leaving without them. Well, you're not leaving without them. The men stayed behind. Uh, so what actually happened was um, I rocked the boat again. The first lot of evacuees of wives and kids left. I was still in the compound. The contractors didn't leave because they left. They, they were left to last to leave. So I was left with the contractors because Sean was permanent staff. And uh, when the boss got to here, I hadn't left. He told Jean, get your wife to wake up. She's leaving. And Jean said, not without the cats. Again, it's a, whole, a long story, but the end result was they said, okay, she can take two of her four cats and no luggage. We were allowed 20 kgs. So we thought we'd better behave. And John promised me that if he was evacuated, he'd take the last two, even if they said he couldn't, he'd smuggle them. So then we get to the airport with the two cats that I've drawn out of a hat. I've put the four names in a hat. So I'm bawling my eyes out, I'm freaking out, and I've got two of them. And in fact, my favorite isn't even the one that won the raffle. That he's back with Jean. We get to the airport. We are the last to go out with the contractor. No, sorry, we're still going out with the main staff then. And I'm crying my heart out. And everybody's laughing and happy because they're leaving Africa because most of the people didn't like Africa. They never went in the bush. They didn't like it. It wasn't their scene. Uh, and I said, hey, you know, <laughs> and I, I was bawling. I was crying my heart out. And a friend, a doctor, a lovely man, he came and he said, he was French, but what's your problem? And I told him, he said, well, then go home. Don't leave. So Jean looked at me, I looked at him, and we went back to the house. <laughs> that didn't go down well. <laughs> so, again, if the boss is listening now, he's probably hating me, but I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, so the we end result... <laughs> 
So the end result was that um, the boss came to shout at my husband at the house with me present. And then I lost it again because he was telling my husband off for not controlling his wife. And I'm afraid it wasn't in the days where we can now actually women can speak up a little bit better. Mm. But then I said to him, hey, man, it's not my husband. It's me. And it's my cats from Africa and from Holland. And you mustn't chastise my husband because it's my decision that I'm not leaving without them. Other people have put their animals to sleep. I'm not leaving without mine. End of story. And he saw that there was no ways I was going to change. So eventually he said, okay, let me think about this. And he left. He actually came with another guy. He didn't come on his own. And then we got a message that John would take his wife and he would leave with me and the four cats. And we could even have one bag, one suitcase. But John had to report to head office in the Hague because basically John was in big trouble. And John <laughs> thought, well, I'm sorry. You know, I'm going with my wife. Fine. We then yeah. arrive because uh, uh, you're evacuated. So it's all quite serious. Um, we arrive in the Congo. You go via the Congo. They take right. your passports away. And I meet this amazing lady who's working with gorillas. So I get to meet gorillas that are connected to the Aspinall Howlett lot. Um, I can't remember the real names. But anyway, she was looking after, after orphan gorillas from poachers. So that was incredible connection in Congo. We spent the night there and we discovered that a lot of people had smuggled the animals. But they had like one cat, one little dog, tiny dog or a rabbit or something, and they actually smuggled. Some of the people did. Some of the people actually smuggled their animals. And once they got to the Congo, they produced their animals, and there was nothing the company could do because they had their animals with them. Right. But I had four cats. There's no way I could have smuggled four. And as it was, yeah. they wouldn't let us take our traveling cage. We had to have a box, a cardboard box, on right. our laps in the plane. Right. So then we get to Holland. John doesn't get told off. He was a high flyer, but he's sent back to Gabon without his wife. And they allowed wives to go back that worked for Shell, but there was no ways they wanted me back there. But they kind of said it was because uh, it was I wasn't employed. So the parks guy, uh, the warden that we'd met, offered me a job in Setacama as a guide so I could come back because then I could turn around to Shell and say, well, I'm employed. Oh, and Shell it. said, uh-uh. We still have to look after the wife of Jean Jude, who was the guy, was a Vietnamese French guy. Um, and you're under our jurisdiction, and no, you can't go back. This was all told to Jean. So Jean quit. He went back to Gabon. He got me back to Zimbabwe to my mum, and he quit. He got back to Gamba and he quit. And they tried we like everything. Jean. We like the Jean. one thing they wouldn't do, he's a good man. The he one thing good. they wouldn't do, <laughs> the one thing they wouldn't do is let me come back, which is understandable. I didn't go by the rules, Dan. <laughs> so we're now in Zimbabwe. And we were on holiday, actually, because we got back, stayed with mum, put the cats at mum. And we'd planned actually a holiday right then to go with his best mate from France and his right. girlfriend. So we take off around Zimbabwe. And while we're traveling, my mum meets a guy who wants a geologist in the southeast Lofa of Zimbabwe right where we live right now, in gold exploration. And Jean was an oil geologist, but I, well, when we got back and we were told about this, it was the area, it was like oh, 70 kilometers away from where I'd worked as a safari guide. And this place here, as you probably will see with photos and that, is, is real pristine. And basically I took John into taking the job because it was a drop in salary from like really high to local money at a 50th of what he had earned. Wow. Living in the bush, no electricity, no water. In We had a caravan. I think you got a picture there of oh. the caravan. Or oh, first you better show the map of where we are. So people yeah. know where we are. Here we go. If you got it. Here we go. <laughs> right. The arrow points where we are on the Turgui River, which is in the southeast Lofa of Zimbabwe. It's a very special area. It's very unique. The bush here is pristine. It's a wonderful place. And we had a caravan, which I think is the next photo I gave to you, Dan. I'm not sure. Yeah. 
And we didn't live in the caravan because there's no way we wanted a, a claustrophobic life in a caravan. So as you see, our bed is outside, the chair and table's outside. We had canvas and we had the open front looking at the Turgui River and the bush. And that's how we lived for the next three years. Um, but that's jumping the hippos story. Which year are we, by the way? Um, when when is, now, this is this 91? Uh, Crikey, wait. This is 1990, October the 7th, my birthday, we moved there. And um, we were in the caravan for three years, but the drought started in 91. And what actually happened was we were supposed to take the job for six months. jean Roger had said to me, there's no ways I'm earning Mickey Mouse money and living in a caravan or living in a bush like this for the rest of my life. I, I'm, a, I'm a geologist. I want to do a bit more and I want to travel. So we'll do six months, we'll live like this and we'll leave. And that was the deal. And then he fell in love with the area. And John is like me, he has to have space. He has to have the freedom of no um, people around, no houses, no nothing. He's a pilot. So he gets his passion from airplanes. He's not an animal guy. He's a, he's a pilot. Um, and his thing is, is clouds, the plane, the mountains, flying, gliding, engine right. flying, you name it. Um, my thing is is animals, but we agree to differ on what we what our passions are. And anyway, we are now in the bush. We are over the six months that he told me we would have. We're still here a year later. We've just met the neighbours who, at that stage, owned the property we were on, um, and they were like eighteen kilometres away. And um, we were living a nice life. I was just in the bush enjoying myself. And then the drought hit, or should I say the rains didn't come. Right. And it was really obvious that we weren't going to get rain because the way it works in Africa is it, the animals tell you, nature tells you before something happens, anything. And yeah. like with tsunamis, animals tell you when there's a tsunami. You know, you know all about this. Yeah. So basically it was obvious that it was going to be a bad year. And as I'd been a safari guide, the signs were all there. And I got worried because by then I had made not friends. I had got to know the hippos that were our neighbors and they were our closest neighbors. And there was two groups, 15 hippo in total. And I actually named them because I believe animals are entitled to names as much as we are. So there was Happy's family, which was the bull in the one group and Bob's family in the other group. Um, I had learned also very early on that Bob and his dominant female blackface really didn't like human beings. And they both tried to kill me very quickly. In the wow. hippos have this horrible rap that, that they're aggressive, that they're nasty animals and that they kill more people in Africa than anything. And there is reasons that they get given that because yes, they do kill people, but so do lions, so do elephants, so do buffalo, so do mosquitoes. Um, right. In the case of hippos, um, they live in water, obviously, and 90% of the places where they live, there are people, because where there's water, there's people. Right. And so they come into contact all the time with people, and they cannot um, escape them. So they're either going to get frightened by people doing something to them, in the case of um, drunken people throwing stones at them, or people thinking they're dangerous and chucking something at them, or hunters shooting them, or poachers hassling them. But somewhere along the line, that is Bob that you've just shown. He was my boy. Um, I'm coming to him. He He's the logo of the Turgui Hippo Trust, and he always will be. Um, and he basically had been hassled by people. And in fact, he'd been hassled by sport hunters, trophy hunters. Oh. And his aggression, I believe, came from that because he'd had his kids killed. He had had his brothers killed. He had probably had a few sisters killed. And Bob did not like people. He was not just aggressive in the eyes. He'd actually leave the water and try and take you out. And there was another hippo who was called Blackface. Um, I think she comes later on my show, but I, on my slides, but I'll, I'll show you when she comes up. Is this her? She also, there she is. Okay, that's Blackface. And she was really aggressive. She was even worse than Bob. And I couldn't figure it out because I'd worked in national parks 
I'd worked where animals were not shot, where they were poaching was minimal, where trophy hunting was zero. And these hippos, or at least her and Bob, were not friendly. And Blackface put me up so many trees because when you get charged by a hippo, you cannot outrun it. They, they run at 35 k's an hour. We, we actually time Bobby running. And you, you can't outrun them. And if you're on the flat ground, you've had it. Um, but if there's a tree, you climb it. And if you think you can't climb a tree, wait till you've got a two and a half ton hippo behind you. <laughs> Anybody will climb a tree. Mm. And she taught me, and Bobby taught me to climb big trees. I used to climb them when I, I was a child, but I learned to try climb them as a, as a girl, a woman. Anyway, she had a history. Again, I didn't know her history at that stage. I just know, she knew she was very cantankerous, but it was good because you must never ever underestimate a wild animal. You, you mustn't treat it like your pet, like your dog or your cat. And that's, I don't call them pets. It's my person, my animal person that lives with me. Um, but you mustn't do that because they're wild, they're free. And you know that Dan. Yeah. So like she kept me on my toes. You know, she, she stopped me being blase with them because as things moved, lots of things happened, but I, I'm jumping again. Um, while this was all going on with an aggressive black face and an aggressive bulb and having to be really careful, the drought started. Right. And so, so I went to our neighbors, um, which the guy is called Roger Whittle of the Humani Ranch. And he at that time was the landlord. And I asked him, I said, Roger, what's going to happen to the animals? This is going to be a bad drought. And he said, well, I'm going to feed my rhino. He had black and white rhino and they're endangered species. But at that stage, this wasn't what it is now, a conservancy. It was um, cattle ranching. And he said, I'm going to look after my cattle. That's my business. And the animals will have to take the chance, which is understandable. So I said, OK, fine. If I can feed the hippo, can I do it? And he looked at me and he said, you think a pom can do it? Then you can try. And that was like a big smirk on his face. And he gave me permission, but he, he basically thought I was nuts. And then it started. And the first thing I did was try to get advice. And I actually contacted zoos. I contacted London Zoo. I contacted American zoos. I contacted any expert I could find to find out, A, could they be fed? B, what did you feed them? How did you do it? Blah, blah, blah. And the, the main thing I got from zoos was lucerne, which I couldn't get hold of in Zimbabwe. There wasn't any. Um, as a bulk feed, which is a great grass, but there wasn't any at the time. Right. Then someone said soya bean hay, and I did find a contact with soya bean hay, so that was brilliant. And you had to have horse cubes, and you had to have molasses, which is a sugar like black syrup to, to encourage the hippos to eat. And you had to have um, a survival ration, which was actually for cattle, um, which that's another story. And the guy that told me how to feed, he was a guy called Clem Kutsia who captured game wildlife to move them from one area to another if they were being moved from park to park or whatever. And he had caught hippos and kept them in a boma for a maximum of, I think it was two and a half weeks. And he said, oh, an adult hippo, 15 kilograms of food, which I think is about, don't know, pounds, but 15 ki kilograms. Um, and that That's will do it. Pounds. And he gave me an idea. There you go. Thank you, Dan. I'm glad you know what's going on here. Um, and he basically said um, that that should do it with some game cubes. So next problem is to get the game cubes or horse cubes and to get the food. So and to pay for it. So I went to my husband and I said, we've got savings. We'll do it. And my husband said, uh, uh, how much? <laughs> and I said, well, we'll start and we'll see how it goes. So I now had some money. And then we found the hay, but we needed the, the, the game cube. So I rang up all the companies in the country around us within a thousand Ks, uh, sorry, 400 Ks, made deals to buy it. We then drove to get it. We drove in to, to get the stuff and we paid for it. And they said, so how many cattle you got? <laughs> and I'd say, uh, actually, we haven't got cattle. We're feeding hippos. And about half the companies tried to stop me buying the food. Because they said, no, man, this is this is for cattle. This is a drought. And I said, yeah, but animals need it too. And these hippos need it. And I'd pay for it. So we left with our horse cubes. 
Good for you. And so we started off and we came home and we had our first food. Then how do you feed hippos? How do you feed wild animals? Should you feed wild animals? Big, big question. How I, I combat that because I've had a lot of criticism from people about feeding wild animals. First of all, I only feed hippos in serious droughts where they're going to die or which I've done twice, three times now in 30 years, 30 years this year. Or I feed if man does something that's a hay arriving in the, the trucks. We used to get 15 tons, 20 ton trucks to bring the hay uh, all the way from the other side of Harare, which is a two day trip to the bush where we are, where there's no electricity or anything, no storage, nothing. We had to figure out how to store all this stuff. Incredible. And basically, to do all this was, was very complicated, but I was determined to get it done and to achieve it. And the horse gives the food and to feed them, what I actually did, it was like you do with a, like you did with Kiki or with your baby, well, your baby mice, it was different. They needed food. And I'm very sorry about them, um, Dan. I also lost a baby mouse this year and it broke my heart. No, it's um, Thank but you, Lynn. basically, it's beyond heartbreaking, Dan. It's it's you feel guilt that you haven't made it with them. It's horrible. I know what you feel. Yeah. But anyway, so like now we we got to feed. So what I figured out, I would put a, a bunch of food down in the riverbed where there was still river water at that stage, and they would just come and eat it. But no ways. All that came and ate it were a whole load of baboons who had a party with the hay and got all the nice yummy stuff and chucked the hay everywhere. <laughs> so then the next plan was to lay it out in the dock now hippos as you probably know are nocturnal feeders mm. so they come out at night but you don't want to bump into a hippo at night because then you're asking for trouble because right. you can't see him mm. and he is going to attack you if you're between him and his water or you're getting his face into his personal space so i had to lay the food out and it was literally I, we would go at dusk and i had an assistant and we would put the food in little pieces and and wrapped up in like it ended up being in a big sandwich and it was actually called a mcdonald which is a horrible name because i don't approve of mcdonald's but anyway <laughs> but it, it was a big sandwich it was uh if i remember right nine meters long one meter high so it's a lot of food and i haven't put pictures there because i've got a video to show you on that and feeding um but basically the feeding it took them and by now the hippos bones were sticking out because I finally got the food on the ground in March. They hadn't had food since the previous year and there had been no rains and they had had no grazing. So even the big bulls and that, their ribs were showing, which doesn't happen on hippos. Right. And it, they were in a bad way. And out of the 15 that I wanted to feed, two had gone and they died. Um, we found the carcasses later. But the other 13 were still at home, or still in the river below us, and the river was also disappearing. So anyway, three and a half weeks later, I would go vigilantly every day and the food would still be there or the baboons had played with it in the morning and we had to put new food at night. And on the three and a half weeks, one morning I actually went down and as I started walking down to the river, I heard crunching and they were eating. And I, I have to say this, I burst into tears. It's beautiful because it was such a, a beauty to see them actually finding the food and eating the food. And so uh, from that day, they didn't stop. And then I had to get them home because during all of this, my husband's contract here was over and he had to leave. And I was supposed oh. to obviously leave with him. I'm his wife, but now I've got hippos feeding and it's a drought. So again, back to Roger Whittle, asking his permission. At that stage, I had to because we were just dirty miners and here. And I said to him, um, when we weren't mining anyway, we weren't even looking properly. We wanted to be in the bush. Um, <laughs> I said to him, can I stay and feed the hippos they're eating? My husband's leaving. Would you mind if I just stay there on my own and do it? And Roger was pretty amazed. And he said, sure, you want to stay there? It's your problem. So I stayed with the assistant, all the staff went, which were Jean's staff, and Jean left. And he came home one week every month to check I was still alive and kicking because he had to work somewhere else. Right. And I started feeding hippo. And 
it was a long story and I'm not going to go into it because there's so much about them. But basically, the whole thing worked. I fed them for 10 months. They got to the stage where two conceived. They got pregnant during the feeding. And Tembai, the one bull, was born um, in June 1993 after the drought. Um, the drought ended in 1992 on October the 13th. We got our first rain. And the, the grass had re-established by um, early December. It was perfect again. Thousands and thousands of animals died. It was the worst drought in this area in history or in, in Roger's lifespan, in most right. of the, the people here's lifespan. Um, a lot of animals they thought wouldn't come back, like the warthogs were wiped out. Lots of animals were wiped out by the drought. Hippos were gone. Everywhere else they'd been, gone. Had I not have fed the last 13, there would have been no hippos left at all. Absolutely none. And two got preggy. And Tembai was the one, and surprise, a, a female was the second one. Tembai is still alive here today. And unbelievably, he's the, the main bull in the, in the one family group. He's Bob's son, so he's very special. He's up at the Majekwiwe. Um, and he has a family now, 13 other hippos at this moment. And he is lucky because young males get kicked out of, of the family when they're a certain age. Timbai was very stubborn, no way he's going to be leaving, so his mum left with him. Normally the mothers actually kick the boys out um, because it's all to do with when a, when a female hippo is pregnant again, she has to um, wean her calf. Now, if it's a girl, female, she allows the female to stay in the close vicinity and because it eventually looks after the calf to a certain degree. But if it's a male, he can't stay and she kicks him out um, because she doesn't want interference with the male maybe attacking a new calf, especially if the calf is a male. It happens cool. with lions. It happens with lots of animals. You know, again, you, you, your knowledge of Africa is superb. Um, but she, Timber, for, for, for the goodness, his mom, Lace, decided to stay with him. And she took him away when he was uh, three years of age. She just went downstream and eventually she moved a long way away. Um, but I'll come to how he got back here. In the meantime, the hippos were now breeding. We were back to normal. Everything was supposed to stop here, but I was addicted. I had been with these hippos for 10 months. Right. I had experienced things far better than being a safari guide. I had learned so much more about not just the hippos, but all the animals that ate with them, the water buck, the bush pig, all the animals that came along. And I didn't want to leave. So Jean Roger approached the Whittles to see if we could buy the property. Eventually, we ended up with it, but it took a lot of leasing and mucking around. And we were given three years. Then we were given a few more years of building a house and leaving. And eventually right. now it's permanent. This is our home. And we have the Turgui Hippo Trust, which is a non-profit. But in the meantime, through all of this, Hannah, Hannah, these, these things, um, I decided now we knew we could stay here. Um, we were going to live camping and Jean would come home to me. I wanted to form a trust because I'd help them, but I wanted it to continue because right. I knew they'd have further problems. So in 19, I think it was 94, again on my birthday, auspicious times, it was weird the way it worked out. I formed the Turgui, Turgui Hippo Trust, a nonprofit. And now it's 30 years this year in October. That we've been here so from six months it kind of extended um but the trust has grown from this little idea of of forming a trust to something that's phenomenal for me in that i have a team of people out there it's always teams it's it's always other people with you helping you and i haven't got people here as such because i'm isolated in the bush here we don't the Conservancy was formed, I'm jumping, but the Conservancy was formed to be an eco safari setup, a photographic setup. Hunting was going to be completely stopped, maybe the odd person allowed, but very little. Unfortunately, due to what happened in Zimbabwe in 2000 on a political level, all the tourists left the country, which was recommended by the governments because there was a lot of problems in this country then. Right. Um, and the owners of the different lands in the conservancy 
turned to trophy hunting because they had to run their businesses and they were businessmen and they didn't have any tourists. A lot of them didn't want to turn to hunting, but it was easy to get trophy hunters. Um, it wasn't easy to get tourists right. um, because a trophy hunter's got his gun and thinks he can do what we can do. And he's told he's fine. So they would come, but not the photographic. So the conservancy was changing, but where we were, wasn't that because we're not into that sort of scene and I don't agree in any way whatsoever with trophy hunting. I never have and never will. And when I was a guide, I saw hunting. I had to. I have seen animals killed. I have had clients want me to sit on their dead buffalo. And I'm not, the older I get, the more I hate it, the more I despise it. But I am the odd one out here. And my husband is actually like me now. We don't fit. We are bunny huggers, tree huggers. We are called everything um, in a joking manner, but it's a lot of it's serious because mm. of our beliefs. I don't want to fight anybody. I would like to be able to put over my beliefs and be taken seriously for what I see animals as, as sentient beings, but it doesn't work here. You cannot <clears throat> explain to somebody that that. No, I, I, and I, I completely understand that challenge that you face, but, um, but here you, you know, you, you're in good company. And I want to say, I just want to take a quick detour, just very briefly, because I want you to get back to this story because That's it's fine. absolutely fascinating. But I want to share something with you, which I've noticed, which is something absolutely beautiful and quite heartbreaking as well. I'm going to share it on screen right now. And I want to say, <clears throat> to, for you guys who haven't already seen this in the broadcast, Jane, I want to say thank you for sharing this incredibly touching message that you've that you put on screen. It's quite incredible. Um, and our love and condolences are with you and your daughter for your loss. But what an incredible legacy. And what I think that does is indicates just how much you are able to influence people. So where you talk about, this is why it felt like the right moment to share this, this message that I'd noticed, um, where you, you, might, you might have trouble affecting people and impacting people locally because of the fact that they've got that mindset that you just talked about where you're the odd ones out this is the kind of impact you've had on people elsewhere so i wanted to share that while you're talking about it that's an incredible story jane and thank you again for sharing that because that's extremely touching and very personal and it, uh, it and it means a lot that you shared that thank you um thank you for putting that up dan i didn't expect that jane is an amazing woman. Um, we have volunteers now that's completely jumping the story, but we are very fortunate. We have paying volunteers that come here, they make a donation to stay here. And as she said, Jane came with her husband, Dave, and we lost Dave. The beauty of showing people Africa that actually are really into the animal. So many of my people that come here, it's not just for hippos because we've got a lot of other animals here. But to see that passion, to see Dave and Jane's passion, right. to see people living their dream touches me so much. And what Dave did for the hippos and what Jane is still doing with the auction site on Facebook for Turkey Hippo Trust, it's, it's unbelievable. And we get people like that all the time. I have Cinder. She, she contacted me from America. She's, um, uh, how do you say, partially, um, she can't hear. Right. And neither can her wife. And her wife also can't hear. And she wrote to me and she said, I love what you're doing. Can I help you in any way? I see you're not that technical being in the bush and all that. Your newsletters are great for your adoptions, but I could jazz them up for you and make them prettier. Would you mind? And I said, oh, yes, please. So now I write my newsletter. I give her the photos. I give her the text and she makes them pretty. And so people get up-to-date newsletters that the world has that I don't have any idea how to make. As you know, Dan, I'm terrified of technology. <laughs> well, you did, you've done <laughs> um, a great job tonight. I, I, I get people all the time that come in either as volunteers. I, I, I am What keeps me sane and keeps me going here through everything that has happened in 30 years, and there's so much it would take a, a year to explain it, is the people that care is the people that feel an animal, the people that realize that an animal is just like us. He's got a family, he's got relations, he's got grief, hippos grieve. 
Hippos actually grieve like elephants. Nobody knows that or hardly anybody knows. I've filmed it, I've videoed it, that when they lose one of their own, they go up and they lick it and they stay with it and they stay with it up to a week until it starts to decompose and then they'll leave it. It has been filmed, I think, by National Geographic on one, one occasion, but I've got plenty of stuff on that. Right. Hippos groom crocodiles, they lick them and the croc just checks it out. He lies there while the, the hippo is licking him. And the crocodile is supposedly the big predator, but they know they benefit from the hippos and they don't object to being licked. And I think the hippos actually licking the crocodile, my personal belief, is due to the dung. From, oh, yeah, check that. That's, that's lace. She's lying with a crocodile. She's past now. She, she's from the old days. Okay, that's um, Kiboko grooming a crocodile. They chew them first of all, and then they lick it, and the croc just lies there, takes it. I've videoed it as well. It's unbelievable. Um, every time a hippo and a croc, sorry. I said that's just incredible. Sorry, Dan. It is, and, and the behavior of every animal on our planet, the scientists that study animals, the ones that are lucky enough to spend years, they get to see it. But so many scientific projects, you've got like a year or two and you've got to move on. I'm lucky. I'm a naturalist. I can stay here forever with them. And the behavior I've learned in 30 years is mind-blowing. Look at Tandy there. He's, he's licking um, that crocodile as well. And it's often the calves, but occasionally the adults do it. They groom each other. That's natural. Hippos groom usually the adults. The interesting thing, it's always in the, the rear area. And I think it's a lot to do with defecation. Because as you may know, when a hippo male defecates, he splashes his tail sideways rapidly yeah. and he sprays the dung. Yeah. And hence the defecation often ends up on his bottom or his thighs. So uh, another hippo will come along and lick that area. Now a crocodile is the same story. When they're in the river, they go down to the bottom of the water and there's hippo dung on the bottom and they get it stuck on their, their spiky parts of the tail. So I believe that's why the, hip, uh, the hippos lick them because it's wow. in that area. They always lick the tail area. Um, right. It also could be there's some kind of fault or something. I don't know. But it's very interesting. It's another behavior I've learned over the years. I've learned so many behaviors. It's frightening. Right. Um, when I go on talk overseas, that's what I try and talk about as well as the behavior of hippos. Um, but in general, all of these animals, every animal that I know and that you know, I'm sure, have this system of family, have some kind of need. They're sentient beings like us. And that's my, my game. So the trust has grown and we continue to do projects. We don't just enjoy wandering around in the bush with hippos. We're here for a reason. We're not just here to, to chill out. And we do things like man management, which all people do in the bush. You have to, because the bush needs managing to a certain extent. And I mean on the vegetation level for us. Yeah. We, if the river is having problems, my husband designed a pump and he goes in the river with this pump and he spends up to like eight, no, about five hours a day holding a huge suction pipe, sucking out the sand and the water to get rid of the sand and you make the river deeper, you make the pools deeper for the animals, for the hippos and other animals. That's one thing we do. What we've been doing and we have to do, unfortunately, since 2000, uh, when the, the politics changed here, the conservancy was, um, as they called it then, invaded. Um, it is a wildlife area. It is not a farming area. It has been designed as an area for wildlife in many aspects. The people that try to farm it with cattle, it didn't work. The cows died. It's not suitable to cattle. And it is suitable to wildlife only. So the owners, which are powerful people in this area, decided to go ahead, that was then, uh, with a conservancy for wildlife. And that was the plan. But then, as I said, in 2000, things changed. Hunting then took over with most of the properties. And the animals themselves started to get poached because the conservancy was invaded in certain areas, not in the north, but in the south. We weren't initially. Um, it was in um, our neighbours. And then poaching became extreme. It wasn't just like it is now. Thousands upon thousands of animals were snared. 
you would have snare lines on our neighbor's property with maybe 400 snares, 300 snares, and dead animals, so many dead animals that the poachers didn't even come and collect the meat. Wow. And it wasn't for stomach. It wasn't for the family. It was purely commercial, and it went to the top. It went right up into Harare places, and it was organized. Oh, God, and we? some people say that's why people came in here in the first place that it was to, to, to do poach, and we don't know. All I know is that you can't farm crops here. It's a drought area. And the people are still here, but it's nothing like it was then. That was a time of Zimbabwe's history, which wasn't happy history. And we then had them come to our area in 2001. Um, I have written a book and it would be probably better if people read the book because it is as it happened. Um, it's called A Hippo Love Story, which Dan has. I'm, I'm glad you've got it because I got it. I want to say a huge thank you for this to Susie Marsh, who I know is also watching, um, for sending this. Thank you. And so thank you so much to you, Karen, for, for, for having a copy sent to me. I've started it and it's absolutely wonderful. And as you guys will have gathered from this conversation, the book is an absolute must have because it's just wonderful. So carry, carry on, Karen. Thank you, Dan. Um, Susie Marsh, by the way, is my best friend in England. She, well, she's my best friend, and she's a brilliant animal sculptor, to give her a plug. <laughs> she does yeah. amazing animals, especially hippos. <laughs> anyway, oh, you got her pictures. Good man. There's Susie's animals, everybody. She is excellent. She does it from a photograph, and her hands create a bear, a hippo, an elephant. She's brilliant. Um, anyway, back to the, the story. Um, I, I'm losing track of my story now. Basically, um, the, the, the whole purpose of living here now, as I say, is to run the trust. The trust was formed in 1994. It started with just plans for the animals, you know, all the things we do here to keep them safe. Then we got the invasions. Then we got the poaching. Then things got heavy. And to the extent that we were going to be killed. You'll get to that in the book. Um, we, we did have guns on us. We had mobs in our garden. We, my husband was, was kidnapped. He was going to be probably killed. And I don't want to go into it. That's the past. It's in the book. And I've put most of it in the book or parts of it in the book. Um, in every world, things go mad in every country. It's humans, we do stupid things sometimes. And that time, I don't want to get it back again. I, I, I love Zimbabwe people, but there was a element that were being used as soldiers, as tools to do terrible things. And we suffered here very badly, but the main thing is we weren't leaving because if we left, they would have killed every animal. They would have killed every hippo. When they first came, there were snares triple stand, quadruple stand on every single hippo pathway tied to logs. There were snares. We were collecting 1,000 snares on average a month in a very small area. Our property is tiny, but we patrolled and we still patrol uh, a distance of eight and a half kilometers in length by five and a half kilometers in width. And we're still patrolling it since 2001. We now have rangers. In the invasions, there was just Sean Roger and I. We spent five hours a day in the bush collecting these snares. That's why they wanted to kill us, because we were upsetting their poaching. Right. And it got very heavy in the book. But the end result, which is what I really want to mention, which is in the book, I'm afraid, the actual people that were doing this eventually came to us, and the one guy, the leader of the one group of men that was very angry, gave me the biggest respect I've ever had in that in Africa, when, when you visit people, you, you give a gift, which we do in, in, in England as well, but very much traditional in Africa. And when um, we used to get mobs, um, occasionally I'd have to give them food because otherwise they would have eaten my goats. And I had pet goats that were my goats. We didn't milk them or anything. They were, were orphans and they wanted to kill them and burn them and eat them. So I'd give them food and stuff anyway. Right. When the, this, all this Hannah Hannah of problems was over, the mob came back, we thought, to hassle us, and it wasn't, wasn't actually at all. They were asking us a question about something else. 
And it was the same bunch that had kidnapped my husband and there was like 30 of them. But this time they weren't drunk and they weren't taking drugs. They were quite normal. And the leader, I took him some cooking oil and food when he arrived as politeness. And he sat down and he clapped. Now, the ladies do that. It's traditional. Men don't do it. And this is a man in his mid-70s. Well, I didn't cry because you mustn't cry in Africa. Uh, we have to hide our tears. It doesn't work. If you show tears, you get stood on and, and by everybody. You, you actually have to. My husband said, is a lovely quote, Africa has dried his tears. And I was attracted to him because he cried. That to me is a man. If you can cry, then you've got feelings. But he can't anymore. He didn't even cry when his family died. Africa does that to you, and it's not the animals. It's not nature, but it's part of living here. It is a fantastic place. It is the best, but it's tough, and, and it's not from the animals. But anyway, um, I didn't cry, and I was honored. And that man and his people have never, ever come to hassle us again and hurt us. And when we see them, they say, how are you, Karen? How are you, Jean Roger? And we don't have problems with them because they were told what they had to do. And just to clarify, so it, it, this it, it, is, just so, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to clarify the fact that you what you what you just talked about facing. And I know you didn't want to go into too much detail. And it is in the book. What what you did, the, the reason you stayed and 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 faced that threat was was to save the animals. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would give my life for an animal, Dan. My husband has learned that. Um, it's difficult for a man. It's difficult for most people to understand that something means that much to you that you'll give your life for it. But I've been like that since I was born. I think I came out of the womb like that. Um, and I am that person. And I warned Jean Roger when he met me. And I said, animals are my priority. And you don't have a relationship with an animal you have with a partner, but they are my priority and you must understand that. And he took me on and he's still with me. So obviously I'll, it, it, it's not that bad. <laughs> Maybe. And by the way, just as a quick aside as well, I want to say to you guys, you, you will have seen that I shared um, Giles found the link and there it is. But you guys all know by now that link is not clickable for this book right here that we've talked about, but you'll find it in the comments for, uh, in Facebook, you'll find that link. Don't go yet, of course, because we want to hear more from Karen. But that's where the link is, uh, where you can buy the book. And I just wanted to just quickly throw that in there too. So um, again, apologies for interrupting, Karen, but I want people to have the opportunity to get even more of your story when when we're done for tonight. Thank you, Dan. You're 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 a honey. Um, basically, like <laughs> we 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 to run this Turgri Hippo Trust. There's only a few of us. It's not a big setup. And I don't ever want it to be a big setup because the bigger you get, the more hassles you get. And you have meetings. And the more meetings you have, the less you do on the ground. I've learned that with all the things I've done here. Meetings are great for certain things. But in the bush, in dire situations, you don't need to talk. You need to do. Yeah. And so we keep it small. We're a team of people. I have the guys that work with us, the rangers now. We have four rangers. We have Jean and I, and we have my assistant, Silas. He's a, an assistant, and he does everything. Silas is everything. Yeah, these are some of the rangers. That's actually a poacher. Right. I could have given you, Dan, some horrendous photos of things that have happened here, of dead animals. I don't do that. I, You'll like see what? on my Facebook, I try and put a positive thing out there. There's a lot of negative out there. There's a lot of sad stuff, and I try to go the happy route. But like I'm this. also realistic. And this here is the reality. This is poaching. This is yeah. killing. And without the rangers and, and being able to capture guys, they carry on killing. And we're right. nothing. We're tiny here compared to all the other people in this conservancy. They've all got rangers and they all do their bit for anti-poaching. But we do it for love of the animal completely and utterly. Absolutely. And this guy isn't poaching for his tummy and his family. He, he's poaching for meat for sale. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, literally, literally a few days ago, we had a kudu snared and she was alive. And, and the rangers came back and said, she's alive in the snare. Now, oh. we know from experience with a big animal when it's snared, 
if you throw a blanket over it, often you can't control it. And a kudu can kill you if you kick if she kicks you. And kudu antelope, my favorite antelope. So I knew we had a, a guy in the conservancy, a brilliant couple. She she is a wildlife vet, the, the wife and the husband, Josh. And Josh dots animals. He's got a license to dot. So long story cut short, we contacted them. He came down like a bat out of hell from the north of the conservancy in record time, but we still didn't make it in time. And when we got to the kudu, she died. She'd, she'd strangled herself in the snare. And the poachers had been back. And the ranger that was there spotting, he had seen them. So now I'm, I'm freaked out because I don't want the poachers to get her because that's not what we want. We, we don't want them to win and get the meat and sell right. it. But we couldn't carry her out. You know, she weighs, hard, I don't know how much, maybe 400 kgs, 300 kgs, I don't know. Right. I, I don't know. So long story, we covered her in branches and we hoped they wouldn't come back. And they did. And the following morning, the rangers found they had taken her back legs, but they would be back again. So then we did, which isn't nice, we cut her up because you yeah. can't carry an animal like that. No. And we brought her to an area which I took her to, which I knew they wouldn't be in. And I put a trail camera because I wanted natural predators to have her, yeah. no poachers. Right. And as it turned out, no natural predator came that night, but a lot of vultures had a, a good meal from her, which is good. And vultures are endangered, so it's actually very good. It's very good, um, it's, but part, it's part of the ecosystem. Yeah, and that, that's the sad side of Africa. And, it, it, you know, the volunteers that come here, we try to give them only positivity and show them the great parts of it. And if they want to physically work, we'll give them a bit of work. But it's more being in Africa, living in the bush with wildlife and respecting it and not having a selfie, if possible, unless the selfie is necessary or if it's, it's the animals at home. Okay, there we've got a newborn hippo and she, the baby there is called Bonbon and she's still here and she doesn't get pregnant. She's now, crikey, she was born 211, what's that? She's eight, I think, nine, and she still hasn't had her first cough. So I'm not sure what's happening with Bonbon. Maybe she'll never have one. And her mum there is Tasha, she's still here. So beautiful. Um, just to let you know, out of 13 hippos in the 91, 92 drought, I built up at one stage to 33. But because we're a small river system and the habitat isn't suitable for big groups of hippos, they do disperse to other rivers, which is cool because they're then breeding with different bulls and, and starting families in other river systems. Yeah. But we have had, since 1990 when we came here, 63 calves born from that nucleus, which is wow. just incredible. And yeah, I mean, it blows me away. And they're not all here, obviously. We've lost some. Three were trophy hunted, uh, that's in the book, two of them. The last one was only last year. Right. Um, uh, a few have been killed naturally, which I accept. I, I accept natural deaths. It doesn't mean I Absolutely. like them, but I accept it. Yeah, you have to accept it. And, and like anything here that lives here that comes to Hippo Haven, that's the name of our homestead here, Right. We look after, and that's another thing with feeding. I just want to mention this for people that are anti-feeding animals. I think, and I, I think I'm not wrong, that most people around the world feed animals, be it birds, hedgehogs, rabbits, if they have compassion for that animal and they realize it's a, it's a bad year or the animals need it because we've taken their habitat or whatever, whatever. Here in Africa, it's really scorned upon by many experts but I believe as we evolve as human beings, as we learn to change our viewpoints in so many things that is happening in our world, and it's so fast that here in the bush, we, we're way behind. We have no idea what's going on in the real world, as we call it. Um, we must realize that even wild animals must have a hand if we can help them. The old policy, and still in some national parks, is that if there's a huge drought, let them die. Let the predators move in. And then the predators die because of this and that. I know all the scene, but I have the feeling that if you're in a man-managed area, which this conservancy is in a small way, hardly at all, but it it is still 
been put for animals to be here for various reasons. They're, they're natural, but they've been restocked as well. Mm. And there is a drought, and it's a natural drought or even man-made circumstances. And you can save that animal's life, and you should do it. And this year, or last year when I fed again, they actually fed in some of the national parks because animals were dying. And I take my hat off to anybody that stands up to the people that scoff at this and goes on and does it because you're saving lives and that's what counts. And you're not interfering. If you feed animals regularly, yes, you're causing a major problem. But if it's a life-threatening thing, it's different. And then back to here in Hippo Haven, right. we feed or I feed we have baboons, vervet monkeys, warthogs, bush pigs, and now a hippo. Um, what has happened? Oh, there we go. There's the vervet monkeys, or some of them, kissing or embracing. Um, we have the baboons. We I don't know what I've given you the photograph-wise. Okay, that's that's one of the photos of one of the baby baboons. Beautiful photo. I love that photo. Gorgeous. Um, and we have them at the house now check that out this is our home that is a wild kudu that is nelson susie's right. cat who she loves and tinkerbell her grandmother both of them came from helen jarman their rescue cats because they were going to be left behind on an invaded farm and that's a wild kudu Incredible. and she sniffs it she sniffs nelson um we have now right at this moment and that's jumping away but we 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 have warthogs now we started off with one warthog way back. Now we have 12 warthogs. And the reason I feed the warthogs is we have a specific group of poachers that target only warthogs and have been for the last 12 years. We know who they are. We know where they live. But whenever we've gone into their villages with the police and national parks, they're gone because they know. They're, the informers tell them informers, they get out. Right. Yeah. And they're warthog poachers. So, like, if I feed the warties here at home, they don't go way into the bush where the poachers can't be heard with their dogs because they use dogs to track and get the war dogs in their holes. Um, so I feed them close to, I feed them at home and the warties live close to home in holes that we can regularly check and keep right. an eye on. And touchwood, they are expanding in their numbers and not decreasing. And I believe that's nothing wrong with giving them food. And they also go in the bush. They don't live here permanently. Nothing wrong um, at all. And same with to, feeding. Say, you know, with regards to that point you just made, I think it's really important to state, you know, where there's a, an argument against feeding animals. I understand that argument and I understand the, the implications of ignoring it. But let's face it, what they're talking about there is the need for humans to not interfere. Well, that ship has sailed. Humans interfered. Most of the problems animals face is because of human interference, whether that's snares, whether that's drought, because let's face it, droughts could just as likely be man-made because of the climate change we're affecting, or whether it's just encroachment on natural habitat, whatever it may be, we've already interfered, and we've in interfered negatively. What you're doing is incredibly positive, so I fully stand by you, and I know that everyone watching will do the same thing, because you, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about 63 carbs over the course of the nearly 30 years since you saved those hippos lives if you hadn't stepped in and done that so uh, there's no disagreement from us thank you dan and you know the biggest beauty about being on your program is i've managed to see some of your illustrious guests and i'm so honored to be with virginia who i adore i adore virginia mckenna i know her but to be on the same series as virginia blows my mind um, and all your guests, every one of them, their compassion, their their love, their feeling, it makes me feel less alone because I am alone. I, I've got my husband, but he doesn't have the love that I have. So to actually see other people with the same drive and to know you're not the only one like that. And as I said to you, the team of people that helped me, Susie, I, I, if, I, if I list them, I'll forget people, but in Canada, that's very important. They started a not-for-profit trust in Canada for me, which is run by Andrew and Kelsey, who started right. by Stephen Gordon. Right. And if I didn't have that, the monies wouldn't come to Zimbabwe because of issues. Right. Um, I, I love them for that. Um, there are so many people out there that keep helping me do it, but they're, 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 they're virtual, some of them. I've never met them. And sometimes I meet them if I do a talk in England. Um, but 
back to feeding of the animals, I have to defend it because I am criticized for it at times, but it's not regular and it's not for pleasure for me. And I'm very careful with the volunteers. Mm. The animals, when we meet them in the bush, I don't talk to them. So they don't see me as Karen in the bush. They only see me as Karen here at the house. Right. So if I meet the Warties in the bush, I don't say hi. If I did, they might think all people are cool. Right. They must realize it's just here, which is how it works. And same right. with the baboons. And I'm called monkey mother, monkey this, monkey that, and the mad woman who talks to animals and all this stuff. And that's how I learned the hippos because I learned that aggression like Bobby had and Blackface had if you tried to just be there, you were human, you, you smelt of human, you look, you're a human, and they wanted to take me out and kill me. So I started to talk to them because I realized that hippos are very talkative animals. They're very gregarious. They talk all the time above mm. the water and under the water. And they responded to my voice to the extent that after three years, Bobby stopped trying to kill me. Blackface was always cantankerous, but she calmed down. And just to give you Blackface's history, a guy that lived here long before we came here wanted to capture a baby hippo to sell it. And he, I heard this from somebody. And so he put a lasso in a tree and he caught the baby. And the mother was obviously Blackface because he said it was a mean black hippo. And she was the only one here then. Got very upset, obviously. And when a, a two-ton, that's Bob, actually dead that's not blackface um that is when bobby naturally died he was killed by another hippo that gives you an idea of size people right. might un ask why am i having a photograph with a dead hippo bob was everything to me he started this he gave me the the the, the thing to move on because he taught me i i could be with bob when he was mating when he was playing from everything from being an aggressive animal that wanted to kill me he went on telly. He's been on all sorts of television programs. In the old days, he and I went on telly, but he was the star. And I'd call him, and he'd come from half a K away, like a tidal wave under the water wow. because I was calling his name. And he would stop maybe 15, 20 feet from me, and people got that on camera. And that was an animal that wanted to kill me when I first met him. But it took three years for him to calm down, and he calmed down through my voice. Um, as you see, I talk a lot. And I just constantly talk to the hippos. And these people here say, hey, mad woman, it talks to hippos. But the thing is, it worked. It actually worked. And all my hippos know their names. And they're not my hippos. Don't get me wrong. They're not mine. It's just a terminology. But know they mean. know their names. And they respond to me. Like Kiki responds to you. It's all to do with love. If you love something, you get response. If right. you hate something... You get fear, you get anger. And if you treat something with anger and fear, it will come back at you, human or animal. Okay, you take this guy, Joe. My supporters, the supporters of the trust, they know about Joe and the Facebook people. Joe is a wild baboon there. Unfortunately, he did die. He is part of the troop. He was one of the subservient males, but he was one of the biggest. He had never had physical contact with me and he pitched up the one day and he was sick, really sick. And we couldn't figure out. At first we were worried it was rabies, but we realized it wasn't. But he was very sick and he wanted me to help him. So to cut a story short, I started to give him food for nutrition like citrus. And man, to find food here is not easy. We, we live four hours away from the nearest village there and back and there's no fresh produce and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, I got him citrus. I got him food. He started to respond, but he was incredibly weak. He couldn't keep up with the troop. So then he moved to the house permanently and he lived in our gazebo. Then he got sicker and we moved him into the garage for safety for him because unfortunately, and it's again, it's natural, it's nature. When a wild animal is sick and it's part of a family group, often the family will turn on the wild animal, like in the case of goats. Yeah. like in the case of hippos sometimes. Most animals will, and it's kind of natural selection. They know the animal can't keep up with the rest. And rather than let it suffer, they, they kill it. Yeah. Or they put it in such a position that a predator will take it. But anyway, for Joe's sake, I put him in the garage, which is an open garage with a gate, so he's fenced in. I worked with him for three months. We tried everything. 
to pull him through. He didn't make it. And eventually it got to the stage he wasn't in pain. Two days before he died, he, he was in pain. I contacted a wonderful girl up in the north of the Conservancy to come and put him down with, with darting him and to put him down. But when she arrived, I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't do it. And he wasn't in pain anymore. And she understood and it didn't work because her darting thing wasn't working properly. Nothing was working. Fate was telling us it right. wasn't supposed to happen right. because I felt like I was murdering him. And a long story, the, the, about two days later, he then went way down. And I believe in, in natural remedies and things. I tried a lot of things. I then asked him to go. When an animal is ready to die, and I'm sure lots of people know this, if you can see it's hurting and you say to that cat or that dog or whatever, you go now. Um, it's your time. You must go. You must leave. The animal will die because often they hang on to yeah. us. It's like humans as well. We hang and on to us. each other. Sorry, I'm Bit no, no, no. I, um, no, I, so, I, I and think for, it's fascinating and true. They hang on, they hang on to us, but they also hang on for us. I think, and people do the same. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And so, like, if you give them permission, okay, you can go now. They'll go. I've yeah. seen it time and time again. Yeah. So I did that with Joe. In fact, I, I asked him. I said, "Please go, Joe. I don't want to have to kill you." And the following morning at five o'clock, he'd gone. That was Joe. Um, there's other pictures there. I don't know what you've got there, Dan. I'm sure people are sick of looking at us and would like to see some of the pictures because I've, I've actually forgotten what I've given you. Okay, <laughs> that's a fun one. Uh, that's Vixen. Now, she's still here. There she was was young. Lynette Johnson, who loves baboons, will love this. Vixen um, was natural. She's got a mum. or mum's dead now, but she had a mum. And all of a sudden, this young juvenile started... I was sitting down one day and she walked up to me and starts playing with my hair. Now, baboons do that in captivity, they're being hand reared, but not wild ones who have mothers and sisters and aunts and uncles. And she started to groom me. And then horrifically, she would find something in my hair and eat it. So it tells you a lot about my hair. Um, <laughs> but she still does it. And I think I lose track with all their dates and that, but I think she's now about eight years old and she was grooming me yesterday. And she is incredible. In fact, we had little children here about a week ago, and two of the little children got to stroke her. She is an amazing baboon. She's wild. But they're not any of the others. And I actually don't allow contact unless I know 100% secure for the, the person. As I was a safari guide, I don't want anybody sure. to get hurt. and They mustn't take advantage of the animal. Okay, that's my guys. Um, you see how close I can get to them uh, from aggressive and I'm talking emotionally today, but there is a scientific basis to what I do on a behavioral basis. I'm not a scientist, don't want to be one, but I have all the knowledge for 30 years of studying hippos. And I've been used as experts. Some of people that know me have said, why are you an expert? Well, after 30 years of studying hippos, I know more about them than I know about my husband um, <laughs> because I've spent my life with them. And... <laughs> So I, I kind of people think I'm an expert. That's fine. But whatever the case is, I don't underestimate them. I'm not stupid. I don't try and stroke them. But there are examples of all sorts of things that have happened. And it's it is so much that happens here and that I've learned from these animals. And you never stop learning in Africa. You never stop learning anywhere. Um, right. You'll always learn about squirrels. You'll always learn about your animals in your life. Absolutely. Okay, that's on land. And they are there, they were about 20, 20, no, 12 meters. Yeah, about 15 meters from me, maybe less. That's what I get with them. Um, I've taken specifically Jane, actually, and a few people, I've taken them on land with the hippos. Usually people that I'm sure will be fine and will listen to me. I have to be bossy. I, I have to say, don't do this, do that, because right. you've got to protect people with you. You, you mustn't do stupid things. Um, but on my own, it's a different kettle of fish. And I've actually said to my husband, if an animal ever kills me, I do not want that animal killed. It's Same not here. the animal's fault. It's my own ignorance and stupidity. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You know, don't blame an animal for your own mistake. Absolutely. Um, but in the case of the hippos, it's special for me to have that. It, it means the world to me. 
because they trust me. Yeah. Okay, and look at this. This this is our rescue cats. That big fat one, orange one, is an SPCA, RSPCA in England cat. Um, that's Nelson with his bottom to us. And that is, I think it's Ben Wartog. I'm not sure. I think it's Ben. We've got uh, a lot of babies here, six babies. Um, and he grooms the cats and he licks them and he picks them up. And the cats love it. It's, it's, How gorgeous. And these are wild warthogs. We've never had so them. People understand. A wild warthog can kill a lion in, in when it's defending itself. If it's mad. Yeah. Yeah, with those types. If they rip it, you know, bush pig warthogs, they can take you out. In fact, example there, John stood uh, with one of the females a while ago and he, he, he wasn't being silly, but he had, he had a, his back to her and she pushed him just to push him along. But her tusk got his leg and she cut it oh, about an inch long cut. But because we don't do doctors, he just wiped it, cleaned it and we carried on. But it mm. taught him a lesson. And, you know, you basically don't do stupid things with an animal ever. Right. Even your dog, yeah. they have bad hair days, you know, and you mustn't do stupid things, you know. Okay, there's uh, there's Teddy again with the warties. He loves everything. I mean, that cat, he's from the SPCA, he's a rescue cat. He was three years old. We got him last year. He's not frightened of anybody. He's unbelievable. And I've got a picture today, tonight, which I'll put on Facebook tomorrow, of Steve Hipper with Teddy Cat, but that's for tomorrow Facebook. Is this Steve by any chance? That is Steve. Uh, now that this is this is the highlight for me of everything that's happened since I've lived here. Every bad thing, every good thing, everything that's gone along. We've never we've had the odd hippo pop in and out of the garden because we're not fenced, but they've never stayed. And in fact, one that was killed last year, surprise, used to pop in occasionally. But Steve is a young male, chucked out of the family um, at December last year was fed last year because I did a half feed last year due to a drought which affected locally us and because I didn't want the hippos to go to the people's lands and although they haven't got any crops, if they go there, they'll get shot as trouble animals, problem animals. Right. So I knew that they were not getting food, so I fed last year for, for five months and Steve was part of the group, but he's a baby. He is uh, two years and nine months of age but he's out of the family now and he's on his own. When a male hippo's kicked out, they have a rough time. Seven have been killed since I've been here. The rest have either gone somewhere else or, or disappeared, but I believe moved to other river systems. We've not found any carcasses and they weren't shot. Right. One was shot a while ago, years ago. Um, but Steve um, came to the house onto the lawn and we have hardly any lawn. And he started eating it. So he's welcome, you know, like wonderful. But he's kind of finished the lawn and he's a very switched on little hippo because at the back of our house, at the back door, we've got two bush pigs called Bonnie and Clyde who come every night. They're also completely wild and bush pigs can be very ferocious. These two are amazing. And they've been coming for like four years and they get food because like warthogs, they, there, there's Bonnie. That's Bonnie with one of the baboons, Chompy, and that's nighttime. Lynette, who's a baboon expert, asked me, why do our baboons come at night? These are the subservients. They all roost in our trees, but these guys don't, don't get titbits from the, when the troop get titbits because they're subservient and they get kicked out. So these guys are sensible. They come at night, so they get something. And Bonnie and, and Clyde get. So anyway, Steve susses out that this is happening at the back door. So he comes to the back door, and you can't tell a a, a probably 700 kg hippo that he can't have the bush pig's food when he's used to having it last year in the drought. And I don't really want to because he's safe with us um, in the sense that he could get killed by Kruchek, the, the bull. He could get even killed by his mum because she possibly, I think, has a son, which we're not sure yet. I haven't sexed it yet, but it looks like a boy, acts like a boy. So by coming to the house at night, he's safer here. Again, it's a haven. And Steve is unbelievably incredible um i did send you a video i don't know if there's time yeah. to show it probably not there um, is yeah there is i was just about to ask you if, okay. if i can show the video let me line that up you can you I'd love you too. let us know what it's all about okay here we go and now i'm going to play it without sound so you can just talk talk us through it great okay fine 
Uh, that's the end, yeah. Great, there we are. Okay, so we've got Steve in the background there. Facebook people have already seen this and people on the website, but a lot of people haven't. He is two years and nine months of age, so he's tiny. He doesn't look it against the warthog. That again is Ben, I think, warthog, who is a cocky little boy and very keen to meet everybody and wants to go up and say hello. These warthogs had never seen a hippo because warthogs are diurnal, hippos are nocturnal, so they don't meet. And the hippos fed at night when I fed in the drought and the, and the waters were already in bed by then, or sleeping, should I say. That's Steve gaping. That is for fun. A gape on a hippo can be aggression, can be play, can be a yawn, can be for fun. He's just showing off. And now he's coming to check out Winnie, who's the mother of Ben. That's Winnie and her family. And look at that. That's like amazing. And everybody wants to say hello. Everybody's keen. And these are wild animals, Dan. Mm. Mm. These are wild animals meeting each other for the first time, warthogs and hippos, right? Our hippos in this area are not out on land in the daytime in, in open areas like in some national parks. This is a, a, the river's very small and it's um, got a lot of phragmitis, the, the reeds. It's not open plan like some other areas. So right. they never meet warthogs. And when he first met them like that, he was like curious and they're curious of him. But no aggression. None at all. And all these animals, the baboon, they're all friends. Well, yeah. not friends. It's a bad word to use because that's human terminology, but they are friends. I believe that. They, they want to know each other. And, okay, that's why did I do that? It's to show people that that is a wild hippo. He's actually probably about uh, eight meters from me, if, if not mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And he knows I'm there. He's responding to my voice. I talk all the time because that's how they know me. It's unbelievable. And that honor to have that from a wild animal is higher for me than any alcohol, anything. It's, it's the highest of heights because it's trust. And you know it with Kiki, to have that little animal who's wild come in your house and look at you, it's so special. So incredible. There's nothing, you can't, you're absolutely right. It's an absolutely invaluable thing which, which trumps everything else. For me yeah yeah me too um Karen, and tell me, what, if um, i die tomorrow i'm happy carry it yes yeah yeah absolutely uh, likewise um now i want to i want to ask you um echoing a message i saw will uh, well I, i'm sure you probably gathered will travers and virginia mckenna are with us they're watching um and um well i i'm thrilled thrilled i adore both of them i haven't met will but i i know virginia I, and i was supposed to see her in october but then this stupid thing happened <laughs> yeah yes exactly. it stumps a lot of our a lot of our plans hasn't it um but will asked earlier on yeah, how can people help and i know that you have an adoption program don't you we do tell us we a little do. bit about that um i've sent you actually I think, something yeah i'm just looking for it right now yeah. which um yeah what we do is like lots of charities we're, we're not a charity we're a not-for-profit because there's not many animal charities in zimbabwe we're all profit not for profit should i say right. trusts right. and basically we have an adoption program so you can adopt one of the hippos and i don't put them all up on the adoption thing because i'm the one that writes their newsletter takes their photos makes their video and if i did all of them that's all i'd ever be doing and i have work to do here as well so I've got certain hippos up on our adoption on the website and you can choose one. You will not be just Kai's parent. Whoever chooses Kai, there'll be other people. But where you get individual is you get your own photos because when you adopt, you get the photos that I give you then. If somebody adopted six months ago, Kai, they got different photos. Same story with the video. I make a video every few months if it's a baby. If it's an adult, maybe every six months. So some people will have the same video, but the babies, I change the video. And to make a video here is hell. If it wasn't for Steve Gordon in Canada, they wouldn't get to people because to send a video from here takes like three hours. So I send right. it to Canada and he sends it from Canada to all the adoptees, which is brilliant. It's wonderful. Um, but basically, you, folks. you can adopt it. And thank you, Will, for mentioning that. Thank you so much, Will. Um, Absolutely. There's and, so um, many people. 
go for it. Please do. Well, I, I, I will forget, to be honest, but the people in Canada I've mentioned, the people in England that also helped with the trust and had the not-for-profit there, Maya Donnellan, Michael Sperling, Michael Whittle, the boys were unbelievable and they still are. They're my best friends as well. They're in Bermuda and um, Maya, they, they ran the trust from England. And then Anne, Anne Wilkinson, who I met through her own not-for-profit, which is also helping Zimbabwe, um, the Hawanki Conservation Society. Right. Um, they helped tremendously in running the trust. I give them the info, they run it. The webmaster, Patrick Jandar in France, he runs my website. I give him all the data and he does it. I can't do it from here. It's too slow, the server. Right. We, we don't have electricity. This is all on a generator. This is all with a, a satellite dish and Wi-Fi. And when I finish with you, we'll turn the generator off and there's no electricity. We've got torches. <laughs> um, uh, also to thank um, Cinder in America, Laura Simpson. She is an incredible woman in America. She worked for the World Society for Protection of Animals. It's a big setup. She was the chairperson. She quit for various reasons and started her own very small setup, which has grown tremendously. And she helps people on the ground. She helps third world countries. Bosnia, well, not saying that Bosnia is a third world country, but countries that have wars, countries that have problems, they're animals their dogs, their cats. She's there for them all the time. But she also has tried to help some wildlife. And we are very thankful. She helped me when she was with Whisper. She helps me with the Harmony Fund. And she's there for us every month. And without Laura, we would have floundered many a time. The way we run the trust is through donations. Without them, there is no trust. I'm on the ground. I do the work. So does my husband. My husband does a hell of a lot now. That's another story. But basically, the staff and us still have to do the jobs, but we need financial help, like all charities, all not profits, to do it, unfortunately. You, money rules everything in this world, and you have to have it. But this year, we haven't got volunteers because of what's happened, the, epid, the, cool. the COVID thing. And I'm heartbroken that we haven't got them. They've all booked for next year, all the ones that were coming, they're coming next year, and new people too, hopefully. Um, and let's hope they can come next year. Uh, there's but there's at least we one need more, to right raise here. monies to keep going. Yeah, you you are number one, man. You can stay forever. <laughs> oh, careful. Be really careful saying anything like that to me. <laughs> um, Karen, I wanted to just sort of mention that because I know I haven't I, I haven't actually been looking at the comments because I'm keeping an eye on a very special one I want to share with you before we go. But I know from the people that are watching and who have been on the previous broadcasts, that there's going to be people who are hearing this and saying, I want to help you too. Because I know that there's folks out there with skills that you've talked about web design and various different things that people are doing things to help you. I'm quite sure there'll be other people that want to offer that kind of help. How can they get in touch with you? Would it be through Twitter or Facebook? Go through you, through those okay. pages? No, not, 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 not Twitter. I'm bad on Twitter. I don't know how to work that too well. Facebook, right. they can message me privately. Then I can give them my email. And then we can go through emails because it's because I can work on emails offline when we haven't got the generator on. Right. And then I can get the message and then go back to them. So Facebook there message. Go, if they don't do Facebook, then go to the website for the email address there. Right. So that's so there's the there's the okay. Facebook page, guys. Keep take note that it's it's at Save the Hippos on Facebook, but the, the page is called Turgway Hippo Trust. So do go check that out and drop Karen a line if you can help in any way. Um Gosh, Karen, there's so we could talk forever, and it's there's it. But you know, for you guys that want to hear more, don't forget you can also you can also buy this book, and I recommend it highly. Um, but you know, this. In fact, let me just let me just say something as a complete aside before I come back to you, Karen. Next Saturday, which is the 11th of of July, at 5 p.m. We're doing another new time because that's how we roll. We do whatever we want. And at 5 p.m. UK time next Saturday 11th, I will be joined by a wonderful guest, Kate Stevenson, who is an ambassador for IAPWA, among others, and a trustee for the Born Free Foundation. And of course, uh, Kate on Conservation, the award-winning blog that she writes. So please join me next Saturday at 5 p.m. UK time. And I'll put it out, of course, so you'll see all the 
the uh, the global times, um, which you you guys will know where you what time you need to dial in. But Karen, goodness me, I want to you know what I want to do. I want to say a huge thank you to Virginia McKenna once again because this conversation is only happening for more than one reason. Thanks to Virginia McKenna, but I also want to refer back to something you said. Can I give her a hug? Virtual hug, Virginia. Yeah. Well, yes, there's a lot of there's a lot of virtual yeah, hugs sure. being sent to Virginia on this broadcast, which I love, and um, I'm uh, and I'm sending one myself. But but uh, but I'd like I want to remind you about a while back you said something about how honoured you are to be on the same broadcast, the same series as people like Virginia McKenna. Well, the feeling is mutual. Let me show 100%. you on your screen right now. You'll see a message from Will, who is with Virginia right now, who says that. And I couldn't agree more. So I want to just. Thank you, Will. Uh, Thank you. I hope I'm going to. You better come here as well, Will and Virginia. You should all come with Dan, <laughs> and then we'll keep Dan here forever. <laughs> well, I've seen a I've seen a rather wonderful thing happening in the background, which I haven't had. A, I haven't wanted to in, interrupt the flow of your story, but I've seen some one some a suggestion go in about a, a, perhaps a food for thought mission. Of, of, of volunteers and animal experts and conservationists and I saw um, that suggestion and Will responding to it and I think I think we might just be able to make something like that happen so what a fantastic suggestion and what a fantastic endorsement for what, for this community of people but, uh, but and that's another story but Karen Wow. I mean, what an incredible story and we have only just scratched the surface and I want I do I do I can't wait to now as soon as, I, as soon as this broadcast is over, I'll be reading this, and I urge you guys to buy it because, as you'll have seen tonight, it is what a story! It does it. <laughs> uh, it's just such a pleasure to have you on, and you are I, I, echoing the sentiment that Virginia has shared there. Where would we be without people like you? Because you have just given us an example of. But Virginia, can I, can I say something quickly? Where would I be you. without you, Virginia? Because if you hadn't made that movie, if you hadn't. Have, changed your life and i think dan is following in your footsteps i think actors that get involved with animals should all be hugged till they bleed <laughs> because they are fantastic you have the voice you guys have the voice and if you can help animals or human beings but animals is my baby then it's wonderful and virginia you change so many people's lives with that movie and and i thank you for who you are and your husband was and your son and what Born Free has done. Born Free has done so much for so many animals. And Dan, I thank you for having me. It's 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 such a privilege. It's wonderful. It's been an honor, Karen, and, and we adore you for what you do and everything you stand for and for sharing your story and for sharing your generator power with us, the, your precious generator power, and you've given us almost <laughs> yeah. two hours of your time. Thank you so much, and thank you all for watching. I, I'm, My we better, we better have supper after all of this. <laughs> yeah, we will. As soon as the, the restrictions are lifted, I am heading to Africa, so I will be seeing you very, very shortly. Um, thank you again, Karen, from the bottom of my heart. You're, you're, you're an inspiration. This, this broadcast is all about trying to find guests who inspire and empower, and you, you have done that in no small measure, and, it, and we're so grateful to you. Thank you. And for everything you are and everything you do, thank you so much. Thank to you, you guys, thank you. thank you for watching. Again, all of you, uh, you're, we couldn't do this without you. We love you to bits, and um, we'll see you Saturday at 5 p.m. Have a wonderful rest of your evening or day, wherever you may be, and spread the love.